so the cat <laughs> ran right through the screen door. <laughs> Typical. What are we going to do with this opening? So on the floor was set pretty high last week with the uh, bunny suits. Oh, oh nice. nice. I'm not really sure. Sure, sure. You ever try it with a bounce? No. Oh, okay. I can top that. I can one up you. What do you think about this? Okay. See what you got. The Shot by Christian Leitner. Yo, yo. Behind the back, half court. Money! Piece of cake, Sean. God. Yes! <laughs> yes! It looks like, uh, yeah, we're still tied. Tied, man. Yeah, I'd say we just call it a tie. That's fine. We'll, yeah, be, yeah. Here, we'll be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta, gotta do the show at some point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice shot. Thank you. Have you thought of trying it like this? Oh, well, what if we did this? Forward roll, come out of the forward roll, under the leg. Let's not start that again, Sean. Sorry. Nice shot, though. Thank you. Welcome back to Two Pastors Making Lemonade. I'm Pastor Ryan Axton from Lakewood Chapel. And I'm Sean Griffith from Sojourn Community Church. I like that. It's new. I just tried like touch. a little, you know, thing that you <laughs> <Yeah. that'd> do. <laughs> hey, well, thanks for being back. And um, we had a great episode last week. Had a lot of great feedback from our Easter uh, episode. And uh, thank you so much for all of you that viewed that uh, episode. You can always go back and, and look at that. Uh, by going to our web pages or our YouTube channel. Yeah, definitely check it out because I heard it was hopping. I'm sorry. Speaking of Easter, <laughs> uh, we are again so glad you guys viewed. And one of the most encouraging aspects that came out of our Easter episode was just how many people watched Two Pastors Making Lemonade in different states. So that got us thinking of doing a brand new Two Pastors Making Lemonade challenge, which is called the 50 State Challenge. Yes. Eventually we might do the global challenge, but we'll be okay with the 50 states for now. And so what this is, is we are looking for people to view our episode from each state. There's 50 of them, and so far we've got 11. Yes, we've had viewers check in from New York, mm -hmm. New Jersey, so we've covered all the top COVID crisis states. Yeah. But we also have viewers in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Georgia, North Carolina, Come South on. Carolina, Florida, Wisconsin, Washington State, yeah. California, and Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Hi, Mom. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks so much for tuning in. And so here's where we need your help. I don't know anybody in, South, in, in North Dakota. No, no. I don't know anyone in Hawaii. Right. But maybe you do. <laughs> so we'd like you to share this video with them, have them watch it. And if you do watch it from another state, would you send us a photo? Yeah, and if you could include something with your state in the photo, oh, that would be a bonus. That'd be a bonus. Uh, you don't have to, but it'd be a bonus. So we want to see each week how close or how fast we can get to 50 states. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. And if you are watching from another state that we didn't mention, please, in the comments, uh, let us know where you're watching from. And uh, we'll see how fast we can make all 50 states. That'd be great. Yeah. 
<laughs> and uh, again, continue to share these videos. Uh, we love uh, we love the word to get out because we love to share uh, the good news of Jesus Christ and laugh with you and have a good time. So, uh, and also continue to give. Thank mm. you for those who've been supporting both churches and the ministry. It's been neat to see you uh, give towards that. Um, so you can give online, you can give through our text, or you can mail us. Yeah. Well, before we go any further, should we start with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for just giving us this platform, Lord, this opportunity to worship you, God, to be reminded of how great you are. Father, we know that every single person that's tuning in or watching right now, Lord, is in a different spot in life, but one thing is certain, that you are a God that loves us and you are a God that's for us. So, God, I pray that right now, no matter what we're facing or what we're going through, Lord, that we would just come into your presence, Father, and be reminded of how great you are and how much you love us. So, God, I pray that we bring you glory right now as we worship you through this episode, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, one of the other great feedbacks that we got was the virtual choir. Oh, yeah, that, that was, was cool. pretty cool. That was cool. So we had both churches come together, uh, sing uh, sing together, and uh, had it all mixed together, and it was really, really popular. And I know, we, in fact, it's got more views than our episode. <laughs> really? Oh, and, wow. Yes, yeah, so that's really cool. So we wanted to continue worship. So the Perkins family from Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey, is going to be sharing with us this morning. And we've included the lyrics so that we can all sing together. So enjoy this next next. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his
Wow, thank you so much, Perkins family. That was such a beautiful time of worship. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed that and were able to join us uh, while you were at home. I know for us, we, we sounded pretty good here at the studio. Yeah. I was a little pitchy to little start, pr- yeah, but then yeah, yeah. We, we, we got we it together. synced up. It was beautiful. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, you know what time it is, Sean? It's I the do. fan favorite. I it's Kids, Kids time. time. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Kids Time. Today we are going to talk about faith and why what we believe is so important. What is faith? The Bible says in Hebrews 11.1 1, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. This means that faith has to do with believing something that you don't necessarily see or touch. What makes faith so important is not how much belief we have, but what our faith and belief is in. Adrian and Natalie have an object lesson to show us the importance of putting our faith and belief in the right thing. This bag of baking powder represents our faith. When we put it in silly things like butterflies or purple unicorns, it's like putting baking powder into this cup of water. That's bowling. It didn't do anything. Yes, Natalie. Right. When we put our faith in silly things, nothing happens for us. But if we put this baking powder in vinegar, let's see what's happened. Natalie, give it a try. Wow! The vinegar is like God. When, when we put our faith in God, big things happen. Bye, everyone. See you next Bye. week. Bye. See you next week. Thanks, girls. See, the faith itself was not as important as what you put your faith in. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said that our faith could be powerful, even if it is as small as a mustard seed. The Kids Study Bible says in Matthew 17, 21, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, it is enough. You can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And here's what is really great about faith. We don't have to keep it all to ourselves. We can share our faith with others and let them know about the great God we believe in so they can follow Jesus too. That's all we have time for today. Until next time, I'm Annalise. Oh, nice, nice. You're always trying to one-up me, aren't you? Was it obvious? It was obvious, it was obvious. Guilty. But uh, isn't that something that... Uh, kids always do. They're always trying. I remember as I was a kid, we were always trying to one up each other. Like, who was the better superhero? Right? right. Was it Batman? Was it Superman? Yeah. Or even with the GI Joes. Like, yeah. my GI Joe has a flamethrower. Mine's got a bazooka. Yeah. Always, always trying to have the, the goal of all these games was to see who could come up with the most powerful weapon. Right. Even throughout human history, there is always this search for the greatest weapon. Huh. From the earliest of days, mankind have battled in order to defend themselves against invading enemies or to conquer new territories. With the passing of time, their weapons evolved from simple sticks and stones that could break your bone to swords, guns, artillery, tanks, and more. They learned to dive into the depths of the sea and to take to the skies and beyond in order to create the most powerful weapon. This is Evolution of Weapons.
once. <laughs> Welcome back to Two Pastors Making Lemonade. So we have an explanation why we did all of that. Uh, we found that we could do green screen with our editing software. And so we just had a lot of fun doing that. Yeah, that, that was good. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, re reining it back in. Yes. Sean, what would you say is the most powerful weapon of all humankind? Uh, I would say a belief. Hmm. Really? Now, why would you say a belief is the most powerful weapon? Well, it's a person's belief that leads one person to strap a bomb to their body and detonate it in a crowd of innocent people. Mm. And it's the same belief or a belief that leads another person to go to Calcutta and spend their life serving the poorest and showing them compassion. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so a belief shapes our values, it shapes our perspectives, our worldview. It's the lens by which we see the world. And so it's my belief about gravity, right, that keeps me from jumping out of a plane. Right, that's good, yeah. <laughs> uh, so my belief about a parachute that gives me the confidence to jump out of a plane. Yeah, I don't know, Sean. I'm still not jumping out of a plane. Maybe for a future episode? Just saying. Maybe. Yeah, it's got potential. If we get some sponsorship, I'm just saying that could <laughs> yeah. be two pastors jumping out of an airplane. Wow. No, but back to our topic. You know, a, 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 a nuclear warhead is only par as powerful as the belief of the person willing to push that launch button. Right. Like, I couldn't imagine Mother Teresa or the Reverend Billy Graham at the command center pushing the infamous and proverbial red button. That's right. That's right. Now, there is one major caveat to belief as the greatest weapon, is that it must be accompanied with a source of power. Right. That's why we finished the evolution of weapons montage with the image of the cross. Hmm. Because the cross is the awesome reminder that what we believe in really is the most powerful weapon. What we believe in is Jesus Christ, and he defeated sin through his justice the idea that sin had to be paid for through his power, mm. that he was the only one who could pay for our sin, and his love. He was willing to pay for our sin at the cost of his own life. Mm. Amen, amen. So we're going to unpack this concept a little bit more in our What Does the Bible Say time. Sometimes when I teach Sunday school, uh, I'll call on a kid that didn't really hear the question. And I love it when they, give, when they go with a default answer. Uh, Jesus. <laughs> and, and why I love that is kind of, it's, 
sometimes when I have the opportunity to teach Sunday school and I see a kid that is distracted, I'll call on them to kind of get their attention. And I love how they'll turn around and even though they don't know the question, they will just give the Sunday school default answer. Jesus! <laughs> because Jesus is the default answer to life. And see, this is the primary goal of the author of Hebrews, to show his Jewish Christian audience, as well as anyone else who would eventually read this letter, that Jesus was superior to anything else they knew. So the, the book begins with a short biography of Jesus with some pretty large claims. It says in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our Father by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by a Son, who He has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. Like I said, pretty large claims. The author then systematically shows his Jewish readers how Jesus is greater than anything else they previously knew, whether it were angels or a great prophet such as Moses, or a function such as the high priest, or that Jesus was even greater than the sacred scriptures, greater than the sacrificial system, the commandments, the covenants, anything else, greater because all these things either pointed to Jesus or Jesus was the fulfillment of them. For example, the sacrificial system. That was meant to be a temporary way to atone for sin, and there was a very detailed process established in the Old Testament. But Jesus was superior because he was the superior and final sacrifice, therefore the final fulfillment of it, and it was no longer needed following his sacrifice. See, this was radical for the early readers. It challenged their entire way of life. Now, this might be hard for us to relate because we live in a different time and place. Prophets, Moses, the law, sacrificial system, the priesthood, they were all very big deals for the original readers, but maybe not so much for us. However, it really is radical for us today as well. Why? Well, because the claim is the same. The claim is that Jesus is superior to anything else because he is the exact imprint of the nature of God the Father. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is essentially claiming to be greater than any religion, any government, any philosophy, world system, or anything else. Because according to the Bible, there is no other way to God but by Jesus. Luke writes in Acts 4, 12, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. See, my belief in the promises and teachings of Jesus have had such a profound impact on me, it has truly changed the course of my life and how I live it. For example, Prior to coming to faith, if you messed with our family, there was going to be some kind of revenge. Payback was kind of our specialty. And you'd likely wake up to discover a stolen newspaper slash tire or a missing kidney. And yes, I'm joking. We never read the newspaper. You see, my belief changed the lens by which I viewed the world. Because of his love, I no longer needed revenge. Now, I heed the words of Christ that calls me to pray for my enemies. And now that ultimately, vengeance belongs to the Lord and not me. Jesus was superior because he defeated the biggest kid on the block. Growing up, there was always that one kid, right? The kid that everyone knew that they were top dog. And now, I personally was never the top dog, but I knew how to make friends with him. (laughs) And that helped me out of a lot of jams. But the biggest kid on the block in life is death. Now, I can't defeat death, but I'm close to the one that can and who did. 
It says in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Death can certainly be a very fearful prospect. Yet, if you put your trust in Jesus who destroyed the one who had the power over death, the, the devil, you no longer have to be a slave to fear. Why are you talking about death, you might be asking. Well, because it's at the top of our list of worries. See, if you can't breathe, you will not be worrying about the stock market. You're not going to be worrying about your career you have no thoughts of your bills or whether you changed the laundry or left the stove on. All you'll be thinking about is getting your next breath. And death is something that we hear about every day because there has never been a time in all of history where we see a death count on the website of almost every major news outlet and every state's home web page. So if I'm no longer a slave to the fear of death because God has the power over life and death, that I no longer have to be afraid about anything. I don't have to fear about my bills. I don't have to fear about my career. You see, the same God that has the power over life and death is the one that dresses the lilies of the field. And he cares for the birds of the air. And he knows the number of hairs on your head. Like, I don't have fear because of whom I put my belief in. And if God is for me, who can be against me? It doesn't mean we don't get attacked. It doesn't mean we don't have hardship. I realize that death can visit me in the middle of the night, but I need not fear it. Why? Because ultimately, God is the most powerful. And when it comes to his people, he says this in Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. In this chapter, Isaiah writes that God acts as a husband who protects and loves his wife. His wife is his people. In the New Testament, the church is described as a bride. That means the sovereign Lord who created all things and sustains all things has the strength to protect and the power to make sure that no weapon formed against his bride will ever prosper. That is, whatever weapon that comes against God's children will be destroyed. Someone out there say destroyed for me. Come on, I need an amen. I can't hear you, but I, I'm just imagining you're living you giving me an amen because no weapon formed against me can prosper. See, that's the destiny of any weapon that comes against us as children of God. Many times, God strips the weapon right out of the hand of the enemy. And the, many, the enemy has no power whatsoever and he has to flee. But at other, at other times, the Lord allows the enemy to strike. And we will feel the blow. But that weapon will not prosper. God will take that blow and transform it into something good, something beneficial. The blow may hurt for a moment, but it will pale in comparison to what God achieves through it. And what was meant for harm, God will use for good in his kingdom. It's a story that you read throughout, throughout, throughout scriptures. Let me give you a personal example. Growing up, I saw, unfortunately, first-handed the destructive nature of alcoholism, drugs, poverty, abuse, violence. And any woman or child can be crushed under these circumstances. These things destroy hope, they trample on dreams, they warp the mind, and they decay the heart of a person. Now, now I grew up with these weapons coming against me. But as I fully surrendered my life to Jesus, all of those weapons formed against me None of them prospered, not one. Rather, God would use it for good. So, so when society sees criminals and druggies, I see broken people who desperately need the love and forgiveness of Jesus. And when that same society quickly judges and condemns 
the criminal or the drunk. I see they too desperately need the love and forgiveness of Jesus because none of us are without sin. You see, the devil wanted me to be just another angry man with a chip on his shoulder. But God took every blow and transformed me into a person of compassion. The weapons that are coming against you right now will come in all shapes and sizes. Don't accept this. You give every weapon that comes against you to God and it will not prosper. God's church cannot and will not be defeated because God became our groom and he laid down his life for his bride and nothing in the world will come between him and his bride. This gives me such peace and confidence through the different trials in life. But listen to the promise. Listen, I'm sorry. The promise is not for everyone. So please listen. Take heed. Isaiah says, This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Now, to be a servant of the Lord means to live a surrendered life to Him. It means that His agenda is our agenda, not the other way around. One of my heroes that exemplified this in his life was a man named by the name of Eric Little. And, and he was favored to win the gold in the 100-yard dash. That is until he discovered that the qualifying heat was to be on a Sunday, the Lord's Day. And he had a conviction that he should not run on the Sabbath. Now, that conviction would cost him the gold medal in this event. Could you imagine the pressure he must have felt from those who attacked him, who said that he had to run and they insisted on it, and yet he refused? Talk about a blow. But God used it for, for good. You see, a teammate gave up his spot in the 400-meter run. This was not Eric's event, but he ended up winning the gold and setting a new world record. What was meant to be a weapon against him did not prosper. And God took it, he transformed it, and he used it for good. But there's so much more to his life story. You see, following the Olympics, Eric Little went to the mission field in China. And during the war, when Japanese occupied China, life became dangerous for him and his family. And so Eric sent his wife and his daughters back to uh, Canada while he remained there to help and bring hope to the war-torn country. But eventually, Eric was placed in a prison camp which had no running water, uh, no working bathrooms, and Le Eric lived in a horrible conditions for several years before dying at the age of 43. But my Bible tells me, no weapon that is formed against me will prosper. And even though it might look like it at first, but let's take a closer look and you decide. I read some firsthand accounts from children prisoners who were also held in the camp. Imagine being a young child in these horrible conditions or your own child being in these horrible conditions, feeling trapped and maybe forgotten by the rest of the world and maybe even God as you endure the daily hardship. If you read about the conditions of the camp, <laughs> I guarantee you, you will never complain about being quarantined again. But here's the connection to it all. Eric was God's servant fully surrendered to the will of God and the purposes of God. God did not forget these people. Listen, he sent his trusted servant, Eric Little, to them. God prepared Eric for this assignment. And right in the middle of all this chaos, God placed Eric there to help those people. He had a quick smile and a twinkle in his eye. <laughs> he held Bible studies. He tutored students. He was constantly ministering to the sick. And he was well known and loved by the children, and he organized sports games for them to play. And it was a way to distract the children um, from the uh, situation that they found themselves in. A child can forget they are a prisoner of war when they're distracted by chasing a ball or trying to score a goal in a makeshift soccer field. I love what Margaret Holder writes about him, who was one of the children in the camp. And she shared a fascinating twist uh, to this entire story. It was no surprise that Eric did not hold games on Sunday because of his conviction about the Lord's Day. However, seeing the children not doing well on Sunday broke his heart. And eventually, out of compassion, he actually held games on Sunday for the children. 
She said that Little would surrender it all rather than run on Sunday, but when it came to the good of the children in a prison camp, he would referee on a Sunday. Little would willingly sacrifice gold medals for himself in the name of truth, but would bend over backwards for others in the name of grace. The kids in the camp called him Uncle Eric, and one of the children described him as Jesus in running shoes. How did this man remain humble? How did he love his enemies? How did he care for others? He unreservedly committed his life to Jesus Christ as a Savior in the Lord. He spent time with him every morning, being filled up and receiving his orders for the day. After visiting a monument in China dedicated to Eric Little, Maureen Little, his youngest daughter who he never met, wrote this, I felt so close to him, and more than ever, I realized what his life had been for. It all made sense. What happened allowed him to touch so many lives as a consequence. Eric's last words on earth were, It's full surrender. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. I think it's safe to say that Little and his family would tell us that it was all worth it and that the suffering of that time are not worthy to be compared with the glory they now know, a glory far greater than the blow which achieved it. From start to finish, the Bible is full of accounts of God taking weapons formed against people, his people, and seeing none of them prosper. Even the cross was a major weapon in the Romans' arsenal. And surely the forces of darkness thought that they had served the final blow to the Son of God on the cross. But the only thing the weapon of the cross prospered was the kingdom of God. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Because Romans 8.28 tells us, All things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. You need to hear that today. Because you, we, we will all find ourselves either currently in a circumstance or, or at some day find ourselves in a circumstance where we will feel the attack. We will feel the blow. We will see the weapons coming against us. And it's at those moments that we need to remember the promise of God that says that weapon that comes against you, when you put it in the hand of God, it will not prosper. Why? Because Jesus is the biggest kid on the block, right? He's the one that looks out for us, the one that protects us as a groom protects his bride and lays down his life for her. And that is the promise that Jesus gives us today. Thanks so much for listening to me today. God bless you. I hope you're encouraged. And then I think one of the encouraging things, too, is that not only can we point to different examples, but God has a perfect resume in this. Like, mm. he's never once allowed pain into any of our lives without it having a purpose, without mm. it at one point being used for good, either for us or through us or in us. You know, yeah. like he yeah. always has that throughout all of human history where yeah. he allows pain, but it's always pain with a purpose. Yeah, there's uh it's it's just this redemption mindset. So so we're not saying that that God just goes around trying to hurt you mm. so that he can have a purpose in it. It's just that we know we're in a fallen world and there's sin and there's people that try to hurt me. Yeah. And that still stings, but I know that God meets me in that pain and he doesn't waste that pain. Mm. He will comfort me in that. I'll draw nearer to him. And again, like you said, some kind of purpose will come out of it. So, yeah. Yeah. so if you are have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, um, now's the best time to do it. Because yeah. I hope that from this episode and through the message yes. um, that you realize the hope that we get to have, which yeah. is that... Our God is the greatest weapon. He really is. So, yeah. Sean, would you mind closing us with a word of prayer? Yeah, and I just, you know, um, we love making you laugh. Mm -hmm. We do. We enjoy it. Um, but our heartbeat, our heartbeat for somebody watching right now is that you would give your life mm -hmm. to Jesus. And if you find yourself in a place of pain, I don't know what hurts you're going through. But I'm telling you, God wants to meet you mm -hmm. in that pain. And so I'm going to pray that God changes your life right now. 
and that you simply give your life to Jesus and that he meets you there. And, and from this day forward, you have a whole new outlook. So let me pray for us. So Father, I don't know who's watching right now, but God, I pray, I pray you would meet them in their pain. I pray you would meet them in their fear. And they would feel your love. They would feel your love, Lord. I know Ryan and I have, Lord God. We have wept before you plenty of times, and you have met us in every circumstance. And so, Lord, I pray by by Holy Spirit that you would go forth right now and touch lives. And that someone would find salvation today by simply asking you for forgiveness and receiving your love and choosing to follow you. So we thank you, Lord God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And if you just prayed that prayer with us, uh, whether it was your first time in starting a relationship with Jesus or even if you're a follower of Jesus and you've just been experiencing some pain and today you just reminded yourself of the purpose that God has for you and the comfort that he wants to offer you, just leave us a comment or reach out to us in some way because we want to be a blessing to you. We want to let you know that we're praying with you and for you and walking alongside of you. And we also, if you just started a relationship with Jesus, we'd like to send you a free gift um, to help you in this experience exciting and awesome journey that you're just starting on so uh thank you for watching and um as always (laughs) yeah ready (laughs) pull yourself together (laughs) as always remember when life gives you lemons make make lemonade. lemonade god bless you we'll see you next week off the wall straight in the trash can